Hello, everybody. Dr. F. Scott Field here, and I'd like to introduce you to our newest sponsor. The NPTE Final Frontier is the review course that I wish was around when I took the board exam. For those of you who know my story, it took me a handful of times to pass that exam, and quite frankly, I really wish I had an, a, an exam review course around, uh, just like the NPTE Final Frontier. Uh, check out their website, npteff.com, and use the code HET at checkout for 10% off to all of our listeners and fans. Well, i uh, got a couple more questions for you guys, and then I want to be respectful of your time. But the, the first question I have then is, what do you guys see coming down the pipeline in the future for curriculum-based education? Gammon, let's start with you. I'd love to hear what your big vision is or your thoughts when it comes to competency-based education. Well, I think these are probably a long way off, but... It's all right. Pipe dreams. Let's <laughs> hear them. But one would be more standardization across programs. So if we could come to the point where we've agreed upon domains and you know, we know that every graduate coming out of every program is competent in these domains. I think that would go a long way toward having a, a more solid professional identity, which not only benefits us internally within the profession, but also our ability to convey to the public and stakeholders what it is that we do and to have more consistency in what we do and the way that people are trained. So I think that's a, a really important potential outcome um, but again, it'll take a long time and a lot of energy and consensus building to get to that point. Another thing that I think, again, is a ways off, but could be a real benefit is um, being able to offer time variable education. So if you could build in the ability to test out on something that you're already competent in and not spend the time in the curriculum rehashing that, that that could, you know, if the logistics could be worked out provide time savings, financial savings, and start to address issues around student debt and return on investment within the profession. Yeah, I love that. Stephen, how about you? What, what do you see coming in the future here? What's your big pipe dreams? Well, I agree with the, um, the time variability. I, I think if we could you know, get, get structures in place and start to move this way, um, that there's a chance there to allow, and and that would also allow us to bring in the sort of the post-professional continuum. Um, and so, you know, the question is, are there some learners who could move into a residency more quickly than others? And what can that do for them with regard to, you know, they can draw some version of a salary sooner, they can uh, pay tuition for less amount of time, all of these kinds of things, we need to get to a place where we can start to pilot and experiment with these things because it will also potentially help us address the return on investment questions for the profession. And so I, I think that's a really a really neat one to, if you think of pipe dream. Uh, I think it's incredibly challenging. If you look at medicine, they they really haven't implemented that. A few places have piloted and the EPAC, the pedi uh, pediatrics one at, at Minnesota is really the best one to read about. But we could we could start to move that way. And in fact, we probably have um, fewer barriers in, in some aspects to be able to pilot some of those things. The other thing that um, I'm really hoping that a competency approach, with, which includes integration around these outcomes, around these competencies, really changes the relationship to clinical education and what clinical education means within our broader professional education. And so that's shifting to different kinds of relationships. And, and then this will kind of go into the last thing, but I view them as very related. But, you know, where, where the clinical partners or what, however we want to term it, um, are full partners with the program and how they make decisions about curricula um, and, and how they, I, I just don't think that the continued please take our students approach nationally uh, is, is going to work. Um, and I don't know that it's, I think it's hard on everyone. One of the things that that can also do if we can partner more is we can move to where curricula are 
I think most places would say they're ever evolving. All everybody's constantly looking at what's the newest science or what's the how do I keep this current? But what I mean by that is if we have closer partners that um, are you know from the clinic or from the community that are constantly engaged with us, then our outcomes or our competencies are regularly updated based on information from those folks. So it's not me just reading the literature on health systems and determining, well, what's the next thing we need we need to cover next year, but it's somebody running a health system here in St. Louis saying, Steve, no, this is what they need to be able to do right now, and they can't do it. You know, or these are the challenges we're having in the, in the system right now, and you guys need to prepare them for this now. So those are like some of the things that just could be really cool and I think could move the profession forward. Well, and I think too, right, if you think about it and you use a lot of those community partners to come in and maybe do, t- you know, teaching lessons or guest lectures, it builds that relationship and then they can also tell, hey, I'm doing it now. This is boots on the ground information. Here's what we're going to need from you students over the next several years. Anybody interested in that, please come see me. Come, let's talk. Let's do some more, you know, investigative work, you know. So it opens the door for for those relationships for sure. And that's, again, right. A lot of the reason this podcast was founded was because we wanted to break down silos between a lot of the healthcare professions. We wanted to try to learn best practices in teaching and learning. And we wanted to try to bridge that tower, you know, that gap from the ivory tower of academia to clinical, right? We felt like there was a big gap there and there always has been. And we're trying to bring that down, you know, as much as we can. And some of these, these, you know, options here allow us to do some of that stuff. So it it's definitely a pretty neat option looking forward. I've got one more quick question for you guys, and then we'll then we'll uh finish up with the big question. Uh, but if you could give one or two tips to to somebody who's considering a, a program that might be considering starting curriculum based learning or a curriculum based uh, or I'm sorry competency based curriculum, what what's that one or two tips that you would give that would really kind of let them know because you guys have done the a lot of the heavy lifting for for us already. So let us know uh, what what one or two tips you give. See, I would say uh, start with the basics. So when we started, we didn't even have the lingo of competency-based education uh, in our knowledge base. So, you know, starting really simple, I think, and then building over time and taking it one step at a time. I love it. Start with the basics. Got to have basics down before you can do anything. uh, You know, the fundamentals have to be there in baseball, right? Good fundamentals. That's how you start. That's right. I I think, um, you know, really spending some time with as a program what you want to do and why and and really thinking about what do we think the future needs are of our patients so start there and that's where we started which is what's the what's the future here and so what's the what are the needs of of our patients and then what is the future what does the future physical therapist look like to meet those needs so you start there and, you know, for lots of programs, I, and I've i talked to so many now, and you've got all these great programs, and they're doing really neat things already, and, and they're in a good place. So a lot of the times the question is, well, why, why should we do anything? What's broken? And it's, it's not, that's not the question. The question is, you're, you're already great, you're in a good spot, and you've got these really smart people around you, what do you want to do to to move things forward? I mean, we all know that these needs in society are changing and changing rapidly. Um, And so I think that's the big, really the big thing to start with, because then you have these goals that are kind of bigger than the program. They're kind of bigger than the individual faculty. And then those are the things that are motivating when it's hard. Like, when we were about last year, when we were about to launch year one and you're having days like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it's, this is so much work. If you can go back to those bigger things, then I think it's more sustainable. If you're doing it just for, just because, you know, it seems like people are doing CBE, we should do it. It won't sustain, you won't be able to sustain it. So, so there's that. And then 
there is once you have that work at the pace that works for your program your situation we piloted things pilot things do small things first and um one of the things that i think really helps is having a lot of small wins there are things you can celebrate and we really we couldn't do that when covid first hit that that was hard for us we couldn't do so, some of these little little wins and little celebrations and you know uh it is what it is we worked through it but it, set those up too that those would be my biggest get get the big why and then and then move just move at the pace that you you want to move at to keep everybody going yeah it's amazing how much uh business and education and healthcare and life in general all kind of start with why right simon sinek like what's your why right what's the thing that you need to do this for what's the purpose you know and if you really do start with that question a lot of good things can come from it so i love that take well, we ask everybody on our show this one final question, and then this may have changed for you guys over the years. It may have stayed the same, but if you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Oh, gosh, I I should have gone back and listened to my last No, answer. it's better that you don't. It's better that you don't. Because you know, either you've stuck to your guns and you're staying the same, or you're now coming from a better, more well-informed place and you think other things are more important now. So we'd love to hear where you're at. I I mean, I'm sure if I spent more time thinking about it, I could come up with, with different answers, but I should go with the first thing that comes to my mind. And it's it, it may have been in March of 20, I don't remember, Scott, but I for me, it's how higher education in this country is structured and funded. And I just, if I could change anything immediately, it, it and and we could narrow it and say even how the health professions education is uh, is funded. That that's my number one thing because I think it impacts all these other things. It impacts whether you can implement. A competency learner centered framework if that's what you want to do it impacts who comes and if you if, you know we have a lot of goals around uh diversity uh, equity and inclusion and belonging here and that impacts you know the how how these things are done and we're lucky we have a lot of scholarships but that's not that common in pt um i think that that would be my number one thing is if you could really shift the funding and we could talk details on that but i guess the the bottom line would be that um that there's more of a societal commitment to developing health professions and uh, maybe a little less of a view as well that's that's graduate school or that's pt school so that's on you you know as an individual you you pay for it and then you go and and earn the money to pay it back and I'm not saying it in a utopian way. Like it, it, obviously there there's probably a shared commitment there from the individual that's decided to become a PT, but I think it's shifted too much one way and there's not enough sharing of that commitment to for someone who's going to give the bulk of their their life or their professional life to helping other people and we we need to support those people more um in lots of ways and one of them is economically. So that's kind of leave it at that. Yeah, man. How about mm -hmm. you? You've had a moment to think. What uh, what would you change, and how would you change it? I, my first answer would have been similar to Steve's. I think that the cost of education is a major problem and a real barrier. But number I'm one getting... most given answer to that yeah. question is is cost. Yeah, which is but in the interest is... of variety, I'm going to go with my second one, which is access to physical therapy services and healthcare in general. Yeah. I think. You know, living in the state of Missouri where we still don't have direct access and Medicaid doesn't cover rehab services, it's, you know, pretty striking on a daily basis. And so being able to tackle that on a bigger level than what we can do with our pro bono clinic that sees people once a week, you know, that's an important effort, but there need to be bigger systemic changes. Yeah, I mean, I'm in Texas, right? We're one of the most limited direct access states in the nation, which is insane, but it is what it is. So again, until all 50 states have unfettered uh, direct access, 
we got some work to do, you know? Well, I cannot thank you guys enough for your time and for coming on to educate our audience on updating uh, everybody on the curriculum or uh, competency-based curriculum that you guys have implemented. Uh, hopefully we can follow up again in, you know, three to five years from now and just see, you know, how things are rocking and rolling now and what your graduating classes are doing and all that. Uh, like I said, it's kind of becoming neat to have you guys on here as regulars now every couple of years. This is uh, one of our, our, our few long-term type studies here. So like I said, I appreciate you guys so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, where can people reach out to you and just follow up with you if they have questions about uh, competency-based education? I think the best way to reach me is probably to send me an email. My email is airheartg at wustle.edu. I think the same, uh, sambler at wustle.edu and um, visiting our uh, website, the WashU website. And then uh, if you go to the DPT and curriculum you can see our our framework. You can see a, a, a lot of the overarching um, important things, the CBE framework and then the Master Adaptive Learner framework. And so those are good places to start and, and uh, yeah, reach out via email. Awesome. We'll put those links in the show notes so everybody can find you guys easily. Again, Gammon and Steven, thank you guys so much for this. This has been a, a great time catching up with you and seeing all the work you've done and, and your accomplishments. And like I said, I can't wait to do it again. Well, Scott, you know, I just wanted to quickly say thanks for what you guys are doing with this this podcast. It It's hard to listen to all of them, but I have listened to many. And um, I just think- We, we appreciate that. <laughs> the fact that anybody listens is mind blowing, <laughs> but here we are, you know? It, it's neat. And I've learned about folks uh, that I probably should have known about within the profession yeah. and I didn't. And so that that's the neatest thing. And then, you know, maybe at a conference or something, I've been able to meet them in person be, because of uh, you all. So thanks, thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to catching up again in a bit. Yeah. <laughs>